Good. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is John Rauch. I'm the public access television manager for the city of Bremerton. Thank you for attending our cable television franchise renewal open house. Uh, tonight, you're going to learn about the process of the renewal, uh, renewing the cable franchise uh, between the, the city of Bremerton and Comcast. Uh, you'll also learn why it's so important for your input to be taken in. Um, so you can tell us what uh, you see uh, cable broadband internet needs in the future that you're looking for. And uh, now I'd like to introduce Tom Dushin of River Oaks Communications. And uh, he'll be making, he and his team will be making the presentation this evening. So Tom. Great. <clears throat> Mayor Wheeler, uh, Council Member Coughlin, John, Melinda, thank you all very much. We're very pleased to be here. I'm uh, Tom Duchin, and I'm president of River Oaks Communications Corporation. Uh, tonight uh, with me uh, are Bob Duchin, who is uh, vice president of River Oaks, and Christine Rivers, who is a senior research associate with CBG Communications, Inc. To share uh, some background with you, uh, River Oaks Communications Corporation and CBG work extensively uh, in the telecom, cable renewal, and broadband spaces. Uh, our business, River Oaks, and CBGs have been very active in Washington. Uh, River Oaks has worked on behalf of somewhere between 40 and 50 jurisdictions in Washington on a host of cable renewals and telecom matters, wireless matters. And CBG has been very involved in Washington as well. Some of the places where we have worked we uh, did work with Bremerton, actually, several years ago. We are currently working with Bainbridge Island. We have worked with Polsbo. We currently are working with Sammamish and Burien and Redmond, just to sh share some examples. And in the course of that work, we, inter we interact significantly with the cable television and wireless providers. Some of those examples would be Comcast, Verizon, Extinet, T-Mobile, for right, uh, I'm sorry, T-Mobile, uh, and um, it's a it's there are a host of providers. Christine and CBG Communications have worked extensively with respect to broadband feasibility, as well in terms of broadband feasibility and analysis. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to provide an overview of the cable renewal process, and also talk about broadband and internet in Bremerton. Next slide, please. Melinda, there we go. Great, thank you very much. Great. Tonight, what we're going to do is provide a roadmap of the process on which we are all involved. The Comcast Cable Television Franchise was enacted in June of 2013, and it goes until June, early July of 2023. The way this process works under federal law, and we're going to talk more about that, is that there are two processes. One is the informal cable renewal process, and one is the formal renewal process. What we're embarking on is the informal cable renewal process and those discussions with Comcast. Basically, what that means is under Section 626H of the Cable Acts, the city and the cable operator will work together to develop a mutually agreeable television, cable television franchise. I also want to mention that WAVE division, uh, more commonly known as WAVE, has a cable television franchise with the city as well. Their franchise expires in December of 2024, and we will be talking with WAVE as well. However, the focus tonight is on the Comcast renewal. And <clears throat> during the course of this renewal, there, we're going to talk about internet access issues, broadband communications, opportunities for community involvement, and upcoming events. This is really the first opportunity from a, a public standpoint to, to receive further information regarding this cable renewal process. And we're going to talk about uh, many, many opportunities where we would welcome your participation. We, we appreciate those of you in attendance tonight. We want you to talk with your friends and your colleagues, 
And hopefully, uh, if that works for you to do so, we'd like them to be involved in this process as well. And we're going to talk specifically about some of the upcoming focus groups and events. There has been much work which has been done to the state, to this juncture. That includes dissemination of a press release, the development and preparation in combination with city staff for a web page, a landing page. There are links there as well, and there's, uh, there is going to be more to come. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what is a renewed cable television franchise. Bob and I are both attorneys, and we've been involved in many, many negotiations with cable operators such as Comcast, Time Warner, Charter. Uh, the list uh, the list is pretty extensive. Our work, uh, I'm based in, we're based in Colorado, so you know. CBG Communications has offices in the New York, New Jersey area, uh, Philadelphia, and St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, both CBG and River Oaks do work all across the country. What happens under the federal law is that there's a whole, there's a whole plethora of different statutes and federal regulations that come into play. There's the Cable Act of 1984, the Cable Act, Cable Competition um, and Consumer Protection Act of 1992, uh, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, and then there are there are a host of FCC regulations. A renewed cable franchise, the way the process works, let's talk about that. So under federal law, three years before the expiration date, the, the city, the local franchising authority, and the cable operator can begin that process. The franchise is actually an agreement between the local franchising authority and the cable operator that gives the ability and authorization for a cable operator to utilize the public right-of-way to provide cable service. In the course of that work, a negotiated franchise can be anywhere from 50 to 60 pages in length. There are 40 to 50 issues involved. It's complicated, it's complex. The federal law sets forth what the process is. The federal law doesn't say what the terms of the franchise will be. That's subject to the negotiations between the city and the cable operator. It's important in that the franchise agreement confers both rights and obligations for both parties. In the course of our work, it's we have found that franchises vary widely, not only in the state of Washington, but across the country as well. And Bob and I are, have been for many years and are currently doing work in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico on behalf of them, with where Liberty Cablevision, a major television owner, is the operator. So we, we've seen a lot in terms of our experience over several decades, and it's that experience that Bob and I and CBG and Christine bring to this process. Next slide, please. What are, why are cable franchises important to local communities? These franchises provide what we call consumer protection and customer service standards. At the FCC, in the Code of Federal Regulations, there are several different sites that pertain to customer service standard. And they talk about everything from telephone answering time to billing to what must be disclosed on a bill. And in the cable franchise, what can happen is that there can be references made to those, what we call CFRs, the Code of Federal Regulations, and or there can be customer service protection standards and consumer protection standards that are delineated. And those can go into a great, great amount of detail. Really depends upon each jurisdiction as to how detailed they want those to be. And that's something we will be discussing more with city staff. As part of advancing the communication service climate, there is a requirement for public educational and governmental channels and services. The Cable Acts set forth that basically, and here's the overview. The cable operator is responsible to meet the needs and interests, the reasonable needs and interests of the community, taking into account the reasonable costs thereof. So what we have found is requiring public educational and governmental channels and services are very important. This is where BCAT comes in. And so the programming that you all have seen on BCAT, hopefully for many years, that's part of an agreement that was worked out previously with 
the cable provider Comcast were there to provide a what we call peg peg channel. And in the course of developing new and enhanced cable communications, we all know that technology is changing very, very rapidly. And this is the opportunity for you as the stakeholders, you as the residents to have a voice in this process. Also, it leads to facilitating advancement in communications infrastructure in the community. We all know that with COVID, what happened was that there has been an increased reliance and even dependence upon broadband. Student, uh, students and those who would commute to offices to work, we're now commuting, not commuting, but actually working from home. And there are a whole host of things that come into play. And we think it's very important for the city from a cable television standpoint, from a, an internet and broadband standpoint, from an economic development standpoint, to really take a close look at the infrastructure that, that the city has in place. When companies decide whether to relocate or open another office, just as they look at schools and highways and infrastructure, increasingly they're looking at telecommunications and what the opportunities are for bandwidth and growth and growth thereof. Telehealth, teleeducation, these are all things that are very important in today's world as well. And you've got to have the broadband, broadband to do that. To Comcast credit, they have been actively involved in terms of expanding their network uh, in many cities throughout Washington and throughout the country. And we will talk about their Internet Essentials program in more detail. Next slide, please. So what are the, some of the things we can do and we can't do? One of the items that often comes up is the subject of rates. Unfortunately, the FCC has adopted orders that basically say that if there is effective competition within a market, then the local government cannot regulate rates. Many years ago, local governments could be more actively involved. The way the formula is based in the FCC regs is that you not only take into account wireline cable operators, but you also take into account direct broadcast, what we call DBS, direct broadcast satellite providers. These are providers such as DirecTV and Echo Star Dish. And when you look at the proliferation of satellite dishes, in addition to as competition to cable television providers, that really took away the rate regulation ability of local government. So I know people don't wanna hear that, uh, and I'm sorry to have to bring it up, but I wanna bring it up because it's something that is important. However, there, there are a lot of things that we can do. We can be involved in right-of-way management and construction, as I mentioned, customer service standards, franchise fees, which are paid by cable operators to the city, public educational and governmental fees, which can be used for capital purposes in connection with the acquisition and replacement and updating of video production equipment so that BCAT can continue to deliver a high quality product uh, to, to the stakeholders. So there are a lot of things, a lot of diverse communities of interest here, local government, educators, business and community organizations, nonprofit organizations, and the public at large. Well, as a, from the local government standpoint, we want to enhance the communications with residents in, in this process and in the end result of the franchise and with other sectors of the community. And we want to continue to improve government programs and services. Next slide, please. For educators, this world has really changed. For, by example, for over 20 years, River Oaks has worked with a consortium of five K through 12 school districts, a, a university, a community college, the library district, and the, and the school for the deaf and the blind. And there are over 100,000 people that are impacted in, in that group. Well, what's happened, as we all know, is that the education platform has been such that it's been a hybrid in attendance in schools, uh, teaching classes at home, and, and just creatively finding ways to work through the COVID challenge. So for educators, there's information that's disseminated for students and parents. There are teleeducation opportunities, virtual classroom opportunities, 
adult education. We have a lot of people that attend the community college here in Colorado Springs who are trying to create a better life for that, for not only themselves, but their families. And they work full time, a lot of them when they go there. A lot of them also are first generation as far as going to a community college or to the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs, which is a great, great, uh, both great programs and curriculum and training delivery all can be enhanced with the cable franchising process. Businesses and community organizations want to know what, what's there for them in this process. And what we found from experience is that sometimes nonprofits would like to be, uh, would like to be uh, service, receive service from cable operators, but the distance, the drop distance is just a little too far. We've been involved in talking with operators to make it work for nonprofits. And what we're going to do in this process is empower residents, organizations, and businesses. Next slide, please. The public at large. So basically, one of the things I want to share with you this evening is that Comcast, many years ago, developed a great program called the Internet Essentials Program. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, the way that it started was that for students that were on what we call the free or reduced lunch program, that they would be eligible, their families would be eligible, and they would be eligible for internet broadband service at $9.99 a month and a laptop computer for $150. And this has made an incredible difference. Comcast is, has uh, now provided service to several million people as a result of this program. They broaden their program uh, to include many, many others, including those uh, in the military. And so it's, it's, it's something that I want to do that I want to point out, because as we work with Comcast, yes, we're, we will be in negotiations with them. But the approach that we take in this is that we look for the win-win solutions. And that's what the informal cable process, renewal process does. Doesn't mean we always agree. There are inevitably going to be disagreements over substantive and procedural terms in a franchise but we work through those together. The public at large has several roles. Many of you are subscribers or formerly were subscribers. You're communicators of your opinions as far as your view of Comcast. We wanna hear whether it's good or bad or in between, we wanna hear all of the above because we want this to be objective. Some of you are students, there are parents out there, other family members and users of government, business and community service as stakeholders. I'm now going to uh, uh, turn over a more detailed description of how do we gather this information to Bob and the needs ascertainment. Next slide, please. Tom, thank you. Before we talk about the needs ascertainment, I wanna anticipate a question we're probably gonna get from all of you. Um, this is a Title VI cable franchise. Under the federal law, what the FCC has said, and this isn't gonna make any sense, but what the FCC has said is even though a company such as Comcast or Charter, not on the spectrum, provides cable TV service and internet service and telephone service to subscribers, what's called the triple play, through a Title VI cable franchise renewal, a city can only regulate the cable service portion of, of what's being provided. What's, this is what's called the mixed use rule. What the FCC has said is that even though the signals are all transported basically over the same wires, be it fiber or coax, a city cannot require a separate agreement from a cable operator in terms of internet service or telecom service. Now, here's the good news. Because a cable operator provides many services, uh, when Tom and I started this business some time ago, this was an entertainment business. It's become, from our perspective, more of an essential service because it includes internet. In the cable franchise, what we can do is work with the cable operator to work out what's called a density clause. In other words, how many homes per mile do there need to be before the cable operator is gonna be obligated to make its service available to, to the subscribers? So where the cable service goes, the broadband service inevitably goes as well. So in the context of a renewed cable franchise, in the context of a renewed cable franchise, what we're looking for is to gather information from the public 
the residents, the business community, the nonprofits, schools, libraries, key stakeholders such as all of you, and hear from you what it is works and is not working potentially in terms of your cable television service. The needs ascertainment involves a variety of techniques to gather that information. Next slide, please. We're going to conduct and are conducting a study to determine the nature and level of provisions that need to be included in the next cable franchise with Comcast. Now, there is a provision in federal law that says, yes, we can take into account the needs and interests of the community. However, we also have to take into account the cost of meeting those needs and interests. In other words, we can't just blue sky this and say to Comcast, here's what we want, or here's our wish list. We have to demonstrably show to the cable company that these are the genuine cable needs and interests of your community of Bremerton, and that we then factor into the cost of meeting those needs and interests. It's not gonna work for you as subscribers if what we're asking for in this new franchise is gonna dramatically increase your bills. Tom has already said, and he is correct, that cities for the most part cannot regulate cable rates. Those days have come and gone. So we need to be cognizant of what it is we're asking and what the financial implications are upon the subscriber base. In response, the cable operator needs to meet those needs and interests. And that's why Tom indicated earlier, the franchise contains both rights and obligations. Next slide, please. So the needs and interests are the primary focus of this study. How are we going to determine that? Well, this is the first step, this virtual open house. There are going to be lots of other opportunities for you to participate. There's going to be an online survey. We're going to have a written survey that you can pick up, for, for example, at certain library locations. We're going to have focus groups uh, devoted to key segments of the community. And Christine's going to talk about that more in detail. And there's going to be another open house, such as this one. Next slide, please. So we're going to continue to gather information related to the delivery and use of cable television services, the public educational governmental access channel, channels, I should say, and BCAT are a key player in this. And for those of you who don't know, a public educational and governmental access channel provides the public and the schools and city government the opportunity to provide differing views. It provides uh, those institutions to provide everything from high school sports to informative forums. It is a non-commercial channel that's dedicated to transparency and it is available to the public at large. And as we've talked about, right along with cable television service, internet and broadband follow. And it's not just a matter of, well, there's an operator who can who, can, who might be able to say, hey, we've got the city covered. There's more to it than that. In our work in neighboring communities in Washington State and elsewhere, what we keep running into is it's just not a matter of having internet available. The question is, what is the speed of that? Advertised speed versus real-time speed. If everyone gets on their cable service, which is also their internet service at five o'clock, you need to see if the speed slows down. And then there's that everlasting question of affordability. Some people just flat cannot afford to have internet service. I gave a speech in Miami in the early 1990s. And, and the gist of that speech, this was literally right before 9-11. I believe that day, my speech was on how do we bridge the digital divide? Here we are almost 30 years later, and we're still talking about digital equity and digital inclusion. And then there's a question of adoption. Some people cannot afford to buy a laptop or a desktop. And without that, you don't have connectivity to the internet. Next slide, please. And I'd like to introduce Christine now, who's gonna talk about what are, what are some of the elements of the study? Thank you, Bob. So what are some of the elements of the needs ascertainment study? And how are we gonna go about gathering the needs and interests of the community? Um, Tom already touched upon the different focus groups that we're going to have coming up. And this will be one of the next, next opportunities for um, groups to get involved and get together with uh, like-minded people and provide information to the city 
regarding uh, the things that you need, the problems that you're currently having and connecting and things of that nature. When we talk about the education focus group, we're gonna be looking through for everything from early learning all the way to a college, uh, the college university or the college that's in the area. So every group in that can come and participate and we'll listen to you know, the, the different experiences and um, interests and, and the needs that they have regarding uh, education, especially, you know, tele-education, any kind of, like uh, Bob just said, adoption issues that they might have, um, access to the internet for those that are needing to do tele-education. We'll have a government agency focus group, which will be part of the agency groups that come together. And this will be primarily focused on the services that government government is providing the community and how they're getting that service, those services to the community at large and what the impediments are of those. Uh, PEG access users, those are, we touched on uh, BCAT and that's the um, PEG access channel and the PEG access users produce um, programs and then get them to BCAT to be pub published and, and uh, put on the channel. And what are, what are the, uh, the experiences that they're having? What is their uh, need right now? What is their equipment need? What are their uh, staffing needs? You know, um, things of that nature. Diverse and unserved communities, that's uh, pretty explanatory. And it also includes uh, businesses and nonprofit organizations, those servicing the community at large. And what, again, what kind of um, experiences, good and bad that you're having with both cable and internet and broadband, both from the access side to the affordability side to different programs that you've tried and whether they've worked or not worked. Um, and then of course the residential community, which is primarily going to be like this, an open house and you'll get to ask questions and, and uh, share your stories and your experiences with cable, with Comcast, with you know other cable providers in the community. We're gathering that information as well. Um, next slide, please. So we'll also be looking at um, uh, having the online survey will be the next opportunity for both uh, businesses, nonprofits, and, and residents to participate. There'll be a residential survey that focuses on your cable needs and your cable experiences and, and concerns that you have. Um, there'll also be a business survey that'll go primarily for cable again and uh, the business needs out there, what, what's successful, what isn't successful, what you're looking to do now and into the future. Um, we'll have some interviews and follow-up discussions from those meetings, especially for those that can attend, that want to reach out to us. There'll be information provided to, to, on how to do that. There'll be more virtual meetings um, that go with the focus groups. There'll also be an on-site uh, visit to BCAT to take a look at what the needs at the BCAT facility are as far as staffing and equipment needs and uh, programming. Once all this information is gathered and everybody has shared um, all their information and uh, uh, stories with us, we'll analyze all the data and we'll gather everything together and do a summary report of findings. We'll make our recommendations and conclusions for what the needs, what the primary needs are of the city residents and businesses. And then we'll use those needs and interests like Tom and Bob said to start to develop some of the franchise provisions, especially you know things like the customer service standards and um, outage responses and also uh, repairs and services and responding to those in a timely fashion. Um, next slide, please. So some of the information that we're looking to gather that specifically speak to some of those provisions in the franchise are uh, characteristics of cable television services. So picture quality, um, sound level consistency that you're experiencing. You'll find that there's questions related to those. So again, the survey and some of these focus groups are your opportunity to come to us and let us know what you know, you've been experiencing, what are you, what are you seeing happen? And now that with the stay at home orders lifting and moving back and forth, and now you're not as home as much, you might have a better idea on how your cable service works, how your internet service works over a 24 seven period, which, which we haven't really been able to collect a lot in the past because people go to work and they really don't know when they're losing service at home when they're at work. So 
we're kind of excited to get a lot of information from everybody on service and repairs, the reliability of your service, how many outages you're having or experiencing, any technical issues. And also when it comes to customer service with the phone, the automated phone system, how you're liking that, what your experiences are with that. If you're getting to a live customer service representative in a timely matter, you're chatting or you're emailing what that experience is like online. And also if you go into the office. Um, I'll pass it back to Bob. We'll go to the next slide and talk about Peg Access again. Bob, so, if I could go, Bob, if I could go ahead, I'd like to share some things on Peg on the Peg Access side. Please. And something. This is really an opportunity for creativity. Um, the the consortium that I referred to before literally shows thousands of hours of program. And yes, it's not all local origination program because, as some of you know know very well takes a lot of hard work to make five minutes of video or 30 minutes or 60 minutes of video. And it, it, it's, it's something that when you work with the people that do that, you really, I, I, you can gain a further understanding, but it's, it's the opportunity to be creative. Peg access is the provision of channel capacity on the cable system. It's not a given with the cable operators, the number of channels, varies by jurisdiction. And it's important that the, the number of the channels matches up the content that the, that the city and if the schools are involved that, that they and others that they want to put on the system. Because with all the hard work it takes, Comcast is, is, wants to make sure those channels are utilized. Now, in terms of uh, some examples, the general public and community organizations, nonprofits, this is a great way to reach out to people. The way that the current franchise is set up, there's one channel for government, that is the city access. It can also be used by schools. There is also language with respect to a public access channel. And the channel that you all have, there's just a variety of uses to disseminate and to disseminate information to people. We recognize and that in today's world, some people watch television for information. A lot of people will be using, utilizing computers. And so what happens is programming is being streamed, whether it's by cities or whether it's by educational institutions. The K through 12 public and private schools and higher education, they have opportunities for a lot of coverage as well as local governments. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of programming that can be used for public access. There could be local news, public affairs. This again varies from community to community. There can be community event coverage and issue-oriented issue programming. Something that we're very proud of is that we work very hard to facilitate the ability of the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind to have programming on the cable system. And what they have done is not only do they have programming from students and it's, it's very, it's, uh, to see students that are blind or, or deaf or hard of hearing or visually impaired in their programs, it's very moving. In addition to that, they have reached out to teach people how to sign. And that's something that's, there, it's, there is a very significant part of the population in our in our country that is easy, that is either challenged visually or they're hearing impaired or they have hearing loss and the numbers are far more than most people really know so to to be able to create these kind of programs is something that, that that's exciting to us next slide please as far as other programming that's very important there can be school board and coverage of other meetings that's really a policy call for the city as between the city and the school district. There can be coverage of high school sports and activities. What we found is from a self-esteem building standpoint, it's great to have show these, show these games where people and their grandparents and family members can watch uh, men and women as far as the high school sports. We can provide information about school systems and programs. And, and of course, adult and other educational offerings. I also wanna share with you that in today's world, it's very important to have this channel capacity from a public safety standpoint. So 
in the event, and hopefully it does not happen, but in the event where there is uh, a, 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 an event, and I don't mean that in a positive way, but there's something that, you know, from a public safety standpoint, where parents need to know, students need to know, student, and people can get the word out very quickly, the cable channel can be utilized for that as well. It's, it's really gone from the days of cable in the classroom to situations where public safety is a very, you know, that, that's, that's something that's on the high priority list as well, as we all as know and understand. Next slide, please. So some of the more traditional uses, there can be public meeting coverage, city council meetings, uh, boards, whether it's uh, zoning or planning, that's up to the local government as far as what we would like to be televised. And we find that in cities and counties around the country, some people say, yes, we want, we want to be on television. We want to have that access. And others say, you know, not so much. So it really depends upon what your city council, your mayor, your city council, and your committees and boards would like to do in that regard. Uh, it's very, it's a great way to share information about government programs, initiatives, and services as well. So there, there are a lot of benefits that come out of this. Also, there are issues regarding SD programming and HD programming. These are things that come into play as well. And what we have worked to do is have uh, the ability for cities to have HD programming uh, on their system so that the quality of the programming there would match up to a lot of what's shown on other HD channels. At the same time, we are very attuned to the fact that some people cannot afford to have HD televisions. So the government channel needs to be simulcast and carried concurrently, both in SD and HD. Okay, next slide, please. Bob is gonna share some experience uh, with respect to some of the other items and how they're negotiated uh, with respect to PEG and community access. In term, thanks, Tom. In terms of what goes into the franchise, if you go back to franchises 10, 15, 20 years ago, you're going to see that some of those might have provisioned for five, six, seven, or more uh, access channels. Uh, what we do is we take a very common sense approach, a practical approach to what is it the community really needs. And what I would like to say is that we can use your help getting the word out. If the public wants to use the channel at BCAT, if educational institutions want to use it. Um, for years, we have tried to promote the ability such that students in one area of the country should, be, should have available to them a curriculum that may be not available, but is being shown in another state. Why not? If somebody wants to take Russian or German or, or foreign language or Chinese, uh, uh, you know, that may not be offered in a particular school. Um, so what we would like to see is the educational constituency taking advantage of the ability to, for distance learning. And that's part of the PEG component. So what goes into this? And this, this is something Comcast has a legitimate interest in asking. They're saying, if you want a PEG channel, how are you going to staff it? Um, how are you going to produce the programming? Who's going to be doing the playback and the engineering? The city, to its credit, devotes a lot of time and resources to make this a top shelf production. And we would encourage more people, uh, you or others you know, to take advantage of those same opportunities. The facilities are not inexpensive. You're going to have everything from post-production equipment to playback equipment. Some communities going way back when had a mobile van. Uh, they could have equipment that could be checked out for field productions. And this takes cameras and lights and microphones. This is like anything else. These franchises typically now, instead of going 15 years, they go 10 years. So what you need to say to yourself is, what's the shelf life of the equipment? How long will these cameras last? How long will the microphones last in city council chambers? And in this franchise, with your assistance, we're gonna provision for replacement equipment, such that in a in year, if this, and we don't know what the length of this franchise will be, that's subject to negotiation. Uh, 
But what you don't want to have happen is three quarters of the way through the franchise, find out that uh, from a resource standpoint, you don't have what you need to do a first quality top shelf uh, peg cable transmission. Next slide, please. So in line with that, one of the questions we always seem to get is, well, how many people are watching the PEG channel? How is the quality of that? I've got a situation in another state right now, and I don't mind mentioning this, Montana, where there are two cable operators in one city, and supposedly the channel is dark on both cable systems. That's not a good report. The cable companies are supposed to provide an active governmental channel. And so this is the sort of thing where you need oversight by your city to make sure the cable companies are carrying out their obligations in the cable franchise. We want to hear from you in terms of what you want to see on the PEG channel. Is it more local programming of high school sports or local forms? Uh, is it more uh, driven by national news? Uh, unfortunately, given the times we're living in right, in right now, do you want to hear more about international news, things that are going on overseas? What is it you want and what is it you're looking to find out about from your fellow constituents in the community? Next slide, please. So this raises the question, well, how often are the PEG facilities used? Which facilities and equipment are used? Tom and I and Christine are here tonight. This is not the entire team. For example, we have a member of our team who's on, who is uh, on the uh, board of directors of what's called NATOA, the National Association of Telecom Officers and Advisor, Advisors. He's an SME, a subject matter expert in PEG facilities and equipment like John. And we're going to assess through this individual who runs Fort Collins and Lerma County's uh, PEG access operations, which you might need in terms of equipment or facilities. Fat, we're gonna fast forward. We're not gonna just look at the year 2022. We wanna come up with a plan that's gonna provision for what you need during the life of the next cable franchise. The next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to turn this back over to Christine. And she's going to talk with you about internet access and, and your broadband needs. Thank you, Bob. So um, in moving into uh, the other items that we're going to be looking at in the cable needs ascertainment, we're going to also look at assessing your internet access and broadband needs. So what we're looking for uh, from everyone is for you to share with us your experiences and your needs in relation to internet access and broadband. And what that's gonna help the city do is determine which wireline and wireless providers are currently being used by residents and businesses in Bremerton. And, and what that'll tell us is, is uh, who's most popular, who, who's, well, who's having access to what, who seems to be affordable. And we'll be asking similar questions that we talked about before. We'll be talking about affordability and reliability and we're also going to touch upon uh, some other questions for you as to what you what you think is an affordable rate. Um, how much can you afford for uh, broadband or internet access? Um, this particular part of the surveys and the focus groups will talk about your needs in relationship to internet and uh, where you're accessing internet in Bremerton, um, what you're using it for. Okay, and um, where your need is today and what you think your needs are going to be in the future, especially related to connectivity issues of where you use it, both at home and outside the home, and the locations where you use it. So these are just some of the areas that we're gonna to touch upon that we're gonna try and uh, find out information on as far as the internet goes. Now, how are we gonna do that? Next slide, please. Some of the things that we're going to ask you about are your experiences uh, in relationship to speed. We want you to share your stories and things that you've encountered both from uh, the different operators that you have uh, tried to get service from. So that'll help us with competition in the area, like who's available to you, who isn't available to you. 
Do you have access at home? Do you have access at work? Um, is it affordable? Is it affordable at, at your uh, office, but it's not affordable at home? Um, the reliability. What can you afford? Is it, is it a reliable service? Or does it not have the speed that you need to do upload and downloads? And then of course, uh, the adoption issue. Can you afford the equipment? Is it not that you can't afford the service, but you can't afford the equipment to even use the service? Um, as uh, Tom and Bob talked about before in today's uh, world of uh, COVID and, and some other pandemics maybe on the horizon, we're taking a harder look at um, your stories and your experiences that you've had with teleworking from home or even starting your own business and working from home. Um, we're also gonna ask you about your teleeducation, not just yours, but other members of your household and the experiences that you've had with that both successfully and not successfully. Um, we'll also look at uh, getting information on telehealth and telemedicine, how that's working. Are you able to do telemedicine from where your location is, from your home? Or do you have to call on the phone instead of using the internet? Um, things of that. These are three critical areas we're going to look at, but we're also going to look at other areas, other activities that you do from home or that you'd like to do from home that you're not able to do, whether it's getting um, support services from the city or other nonprofits or getting um, uh, purchasing products and getting them delivered to your home or connecting with your customers if you're running a business at, out of your house. Um, next slide. We're also going to be, like I touched upon earlier, talking about what you're doing now with broadband, both at home and outside the home, and what you think uh, you need in the future. Um, based on how things are going and how technology is advancing, we're gonna start looking at things of general con connectivity requirements that you have. Um, again, the internet access is a big one, both from the business side and from the residential side. Um, what you have at home and is it portable? Do you have portable devices? Can you access the internet anywhere once you leave your home? Um, are you relying mostly on your uh, cell phone data plan or are you able to connect to free internet outside your home and are there areas that you're able to do that? Um, we'll also be looking at video voice and data applications and how those impact your life. Okay, next slide. I think we're at the question and answer period on all the information that we've provided. Melinda, I'll pass it off to you. Hey, and I think I need to stop sharing here in order to access the chat. So I'm going to do that. And then I think John is going to join me here and we can uh, take some questions from all of our attendees here. So there he is. And um, I'm going to just start and read out what we have in our chat. We'll go from there. Just one moment. Top. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, we are accepting questions in the chat, um, but also feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can just ask your question yourself. And that might be the easiest way to do it. Okay, it looks like there might not be any actual questions just kind of um, regarding our subject, but just more um, conversation. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take those. And don't see, there's a raised hand. Okay, thank you, uh, Maxwell. We have uh, Jeff. Um, there we go. Well, you can you can unmute yourself, Jeff. There it looks like there were some some issues earlier. All good. It's yeah, all I I think the main question I have is um, so folks can give input now at this meeting, and what's the future of giving input like? Are surveys going to be sent out online or by mail or just future community meetings? How is how can people speak up in the future? They're going to be uh, they're going to be uh, several 
opportunities for people. The online residential survey is going to be ready to go uh, in March, probably the latter part of March. And that's really, that's a great place to go. For those that are not able to, uh, to provide their input in the, in the uh, online survey, there's gonna be, as Bob had mentioned, the written survey. That, and we're gonna be making arrangements and working with the city so people can go to their local library or other location or other locations to pick those up to the extent that people uh, would like to have translation services, the city is going to be working with them and we're working with the city in that regard as well, uh, recognizing that there are a host of uh, languages. And so, and if need be, the survey can, the questions can be read to someone in their language and then someone can assist as far as filling out a survey. We're gonna be having five specific what we call focus groups, workshops, and we'll be coordinating with the city to set the dates of those. Those will include, uh, as Christine had shared, several, several groups, including government, education, residential communities, unserved and underserved communities. There'll be opportunities for nonprofits and businesses. And that's really gonna be part of the data collection process. So we'll be actually taking people's input and when we have undertaken those focus groups and town hall meetings before, people are very specific. And what we'll oft oftentimes do, we appreciate their input, is we will coordinate and facilitate putting them in touch with Comcast or whomever it may be so that they can address the issues because someone says, you know, I live right down the street and they've got service and I don't. And we will get the address from them and then uh, provide that information over to Comcast. So it's really a combination of all of all of the above and then what will happen is after all that has been done there will be another virtual open house and after the virtual open house then the report will be prepared so the direct answer to your question is there are going to be several opportunities for people to uh to have their voice heard and participate in this process that's that's fantastic that's great to hear Thank you. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any other hands raised um, or any questions in the chat. Um, so um, if you'd like, we can close out our presentation. I can go back to sharing the slides. That'd be great. We'll go to the next, next, next slide, please. Okay. Yes. So, so I'll just say, so tagging on to um, Jeff's question, um, Involvement and opportunity. What can you do? When can you do it? And how can you get involved? Okay, for the residential community, we're going to, as Tom said, there will be a community survey, online survey that'll be launched in the latter part of March. It's open to the public. We want everyone who wants to have a voice come and fill out the survey. And that's everyone, your friends, your neighbors, people you work with, everyone who lives in Bremerton, please come and fill out the survey. That's your biggest opportunity to get all your stories to us, all of your experiences that you've had, both good and bad, with, with any provider, any cable provider, any internet provider. Um, this survey will be available in written form for anyone who doesn't have internet access or can't get internet access. So there will be a written survey available in key locations and those, those facilities will be collecting the surveys there. There'll be a second open house, like Tom said, for the public. And there'll be a time then for we'll, we'll gather information from everyone at that time as well. Um, all of the upcoming events will be on the BCAT website. So as those events start to come up, the dates will be posted on the website. Um, we will send out invitations to key people, key uh, organizations. 
Um, as far as the public, it'll be publicized in the newspaper and on the, the BCAT website, on the city website, things of that nature. So there'll be plenty of, of social media presence on uh, of um, letting everyone know when it's launched and when they can start filling out the survey. Next slide. Same thing for businesses and communities, both the education, the nonprofits, the diverse um, communities of interest, um, the education institutions, things of that nature. We have a business community uh, online survey that we're going to also launch in March. And that's specific to business needs, both on the cable television, if they have cable TV that's in their facility, especially on the government side, you might still have TVs pub, um, showing programs and things like that. Um, it, it's both cable and broadband and is from the business point of view, how their experience is with the internet that they're using at their current brick and mortar, wherever they're currently located and how they're working with that with their customers or the residents that they service, if it's support services or if it's education services, things like that. Um, they'll also be as Tom and Bob also touched on those five focus groups. So the five focus groups are the five different groups that we talked about, the education, the government, PEG access users, um, diverse communities of interest, and also the residential community. Um, there will be key organizations that we'll uh, reach out to, we'll send invitations to for when those focus groups come up, they'll send them out to their members and their organizational members that they have, and hopefully reach everybody that might want to come. But if they don't get an invite, the information will be on the BCAT website as to when that specific meeting's coming up. And if they feel they want to attend, they can come and attend. Um, there'll also be a second uh, virtual open house that they can attend as well. That'll be later. Next slide. So what do we do when we get all that? So once we have all the residential surveys done and the data gathered for the business surveys, we'll compile the data and we'll do a summary report of our uh, findings overall as an overall summary. And um, we'll be able to utilize that to help also form some of the questions and answer questions that we're gonna ask and some of the target, targeted group focus groups that we're going to have. Um, I'll pass it off to, um, to Tom or to Bob on the next slide. So uh, to summarize, we are going to have one of our team members perform a PEG access facility and equipment review. We've talked a number of times about the variety of focus groups. What we hope that you can see is there are multiple opportunities for all of you to participate. And we could use your help in spreading the word to your colleagues, to your constituents, be it parents or friends or the educational community or the PEG community. And this is gonna take a concerted collegial effort with all of you and the key stakeholders in the community to identify the diverse unserved and underserved and unserved communities of interest. The FCC can do all the maps they want in terms of who's in a particular census block, but that's not the answer. The answer is to really find out on a location specific basis if people in your community don't have access to broadband. Um, I cannot stress enough, Tom and I have had the privilege of working with a number of Native American communities in Montana, in North Dakota, and Oklahoma. And what we have learned among many other things is that the need for telehealth, the need for distance education, the need for people to be able to work from home and to develop businesses, to work remotely, to develop businesses. Without broadband, that is a very difficult uphill climb. So we cannot stress enough, we could use your assistance in helping us identify folks in your community who have a genuine need, a genuine unserved need, or maybe a genuine need in terms of affordability for broadband. Next slide, please. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the demonstrated needs and interests and all the information gathered from the online surveys and the workshops 
and the written surveys and the virtual open houses. And we're gonna factor that into the next cable franchise with Comcast, knowing what we can and cannot ask for uh, under federal law. And in terms of the demonstrated internet access and broadband needs, this is a continuing conversation that will go far beyond the virtual open houses. This needs to be a community-wide effort to try and make broadband available from a digital inclusion and equitable standpoint. Next slide, please. We'd like to thank everyone for your participation in the open house this evening. We, we look forward to hearing from you. And, we, and this is not your last opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions, please send them to Melinda or send them our way. We would welcome them. Thank you. Melinda, I'll turn it back over to you. So I am just going to open up the question and answer period. Um, again, I see anybody who has any questions noted. Um, you can find them at the City of Bremerton website. I think your uh, mic might have cut in and out there. If oh, you want to be. thank you. Yep, that seems to be an issue, but not quite bad enough to use the, the foam yet. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was just saying you can go out to the city website. Um, the easy website to quote here is bcat.org, um, but you can also go out to the city website and just type in uh, your, your cable future. Um, you'll find our project page. And uh, you'll find a recording from tonight. Um, you also find uh, that's where our survey link will be posted. Um, and we are expecting that to be uh, coming here in March for you. So um, we'll be sending out notices. Um, if you'd like to be added to our um, notice list, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I do have my phone number here in the chat, but I'm also gonna put my email down below that. So all of you can email me. And with that, I'm going to um, just hand that back off to you again, uh, Tom, Bob, Christine, and thank you uh, so much for your presentation tonight and just sharing how these, uh, these uh, community need ascertainments um, begin. So. Melinda, I saw a comment in yeah. the, yeah, I think there was a comment oh. in the uh, chat, Melinda, about um, will this be shared with the press? Um, we will uh, likely have future um, press announcements. Um, um, and uh, of course, it is uh, public notices on our on our city website. If you subscribe or part of our um, Civic Plus alerts, um, you can go out to the city website and find our, our news and community uh, alerts page um, on the city homepage and sign up for those alerts. Um, and those are also published. Um, I think, John, you can probably talk about your BCAT notices. Right. Well, we'll be um, uh, putting them on Facebook and uh, on our channel as well on the community bulletin board. Um, and then all the updates that you mentioned for the website will be there. I see not seeing any other questions. I think that is it for this evening. And again, I just want to um, um, thank everyone for joining us tonight and look forward to our next steps and about your needs gathering that data and then putting it to work for you. So again, uh, thank you. And uh, I don't know, Jeff, do you have another question? Feel free. No, you're sorry, just cutting in and out a little again. Oh, okay. But I think you were just thanking everybody for-, for yeah. That. yeah, yeah, I was just thanking everybody. And, um, you know, we're just looking forward to our next steps and putting this data to work. So we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you all. Right, that's all I have. Great, thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Thank we you. appreciate everyone joining us this evening.